Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Uh, our topic is, this, uh, this year is knowledge graphs. Um, today is the 11th of March and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Hari Srihari, who is currently on sabbatical at the Indian Institute of Science uh, but is regularly at the um, University of Buffalo. And we'll be speaking today on the probabilistic aspects of knowledge graphs. Hari? Yes, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, greetings, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for um, joining uh, this uh, meeting today. Uh, very far-sighted that we're doing it all online rather than physically uh, physical presence, I think, uh, appropriate for the times. Uh, as Ken mentioned, I'm talking to you from uh, Bangalore, uh, and it's uh, 9.30 p.m. at 9.34 p.m. here at uh, night. Thank you for moving to the daylight savings time. Otherwise, I would have been talking to you at 10.34 at night. Uh, okay, so my topic is uh, knowledge graphs or probabilistic knowledge graphs, that's what uh, Ram wanted me to talk about. That's what I'll mostly focus on. And um, this is actually a subtopic in a course I teach. I'm teaching a course this semester at the Indian Institute of Science and I teach it at Buffalo as well. It's a course on, called Deep Learning. And uh, this topic occurs uh, way down in the middle of the, the semester. And this comes under the topic of applications of deep learning. And when after we cover computer vision, natural language processing, recommender systems, uh, the final major application area we talk about is how, we, how is deep learning useful for knowledge representation and reasoning and question answering. And that topic turns out to have a nice inter, uh, intersection with, um, with knowledge, probabilistic knowledge graphs. So this is, I actually gave the same lecture to my deep learning class today in the morning, Indian time. Uh, and uh, I, I added a little bit more for this audience, but the flavor is a bit of, how is deep learning useful for all of this? And it turns out to be, that's exactly what probabilistic models also do. So uh, let me move on. I hope you can see the slides there. Uh, should I make it full screen or anything like that, Ken? Or should I just leave it like this? Is this okay? I, All right. Full screen might be good. Full screen might be good. Okay. Why don't I do that? Uh, view, uh, uh, view slideshow I should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, here is uh, uh, my agenda for the hour. Uh, we will begin with embeddings for representing knowledge. Uh, this, as I mentioned before, it's like uh, a topic in, in deep learning where they have heard about embeddings for natural language. And the same idea is, is carried along here. And then we talk about in knowledge, uh, we use, uh, representing knowledge, we use relations, binary relations specifically. Uh, and uh, what do we do with these kinds of uh, uh, representations of knowledge? What kind of applications are there? And the applications we talk in deep learning are link prediction, question answering. There are also a couple more, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, resolving uh, uncertainties and different kinds of uh, subgraphs and so on. I'll talk about that also. And then statistical relational relation learning, where we talk about latent feature models and Markov random fields. So that's the, that last part is, is this topic of probabilistic models. So this slide is just uh, a reminder uh, to my class as well as to uh, this group that uh, embeddings are the main uh, success story uh, for natural language processing. Uh, and the reason deep learning has had uh, so much success in natural language modeling, machine translation, natural language processing has all been word embeddings where uh, we come up with representations of, uh, of words as uh, in, in, you know, using the semantics and the context in which they occur. And this is a different topic, but this generalizes into knowledge. So that's why I thought I'd introduce this first. Uh, the concept of word to vec might be familiar to most of you. 
where we start out with a word represented as a one hot vector and we use some proxy uh, method such as uh, the context in which that word is occurring in a sentence and, and we train it uh, using the input as the word and the output is a context word in which it is occurring and then we train it that way and we map let's say a, a 10,000 um, uh, element length vector called a one hot vector they map it into a, a 300 element um, hidden layer which becomes the embedding um, there is a variation of this thing the Stanford natural language group has come up with called GLOW, which is global vectors for word representation where they make sure that uh, somehow the correlations are accounted for in a more systematic way and such that uh, they have the same distance uh, between words uh, uh, for concepts uh, for example uh, man and woman have the same distance as uh, sir and madam and king and queen and things like that uncle and aunt things like that so anyway word to vec is the main idea and glove is just a variation of it so embeddings have been key for natural language processing so where we go from here is embeddings are also the key for knowledge so embeddings for knowledge representation is uh, we need embeddings for uh, for relations between facts so we can have um, so essentially we're talking about distributed representations just like we had distributed representations for words we say it's distributed over those 300 elements similarly here we say we start out with relations and then we uh, say how can we uh, model these in some distributed representations and which captures uh, relations between entities allow formalizing facts about objects how they interact with each other so this is where we go when we generalize from nlp to knowledge representation and uh, I have a slide here, uh, which is a simple tutorial to my class about what do you mean by a relation? Uh, a binary relation is a set of ordered objects. Uh, pairs in the set have a relationship while those in the set do not. And then an example of numerical entities, we have a relation less than defined on the entities one, two, three, which means we have ordered pairs one, two, one, three, two, three, which means every pair is such that the first element is less than the second element. And uh, that, so essentially the relation defines these pairs. And the relation can be used as a verb when we say one, two belongs to the relation, therefore one is less than two. Two, one does not belong to the relation, therefore two is not less than one. And uh, there are, this can be generalized to symbolic entities and we can have relation is, is, a, is a type defined on the entities dog, mammal, and contains ordered pairs. So anyway, this is a basic idea of what is a binary relation and uh, so we can say in the context of uh, AI knowledge representation in general, uh, these relations can take the form of a triplet of tokens, subject, verb, object, or subject, predicate, object. And uh, with, with specific values would be entity I, entity, relation J, entity K. So instead of words as in NLP, we now have these triplets, which are of the form entity, uh, relation, entity, and so these things are what are the elements uh, of, uh, of, of knowledge. And uh, together they end up constituting a graph which we can refer to as a knowledge graph. Uh, this is a simple example. I, I take some of these examples out of uh, a paper uh, written by the uh, Google uh, research group about the knowledge graphs uh, they work with. Uh, this was an example they gave. Leonard Nimoy was an actor who played the character Spock in the science fiction movie Star Trek. And that has a number of facts in it, which are all of this triple form, subject, predicate, object, triples. The subject, for example, is Leonard Nimoy, and the predicate is profession, the object is actor. Or Leonard Nimoy starred in Star Trek, or Leonard Nimoy played Spock, or Spock is a character in Star Trek, or Star Trek is a genre uh, called science fiction is from a genre called science fiction. So those are triples and we can also show that as a graph which is a knowledge graph uh, which nodes correspond to the entities and the edges correspond to the relations. For example in the in the diagram at the bottom we can uh, I guess I can move my arrow here. Uh, Leonard Nimoy played Spock. We, this is a subject is Leonard Nimoy object is Spock and the predicate is played. Uh, similarly, Spock is the uh, subject and uh, uh, Star Trek is the object and the relationship is character and you know, all the predicate is that. 
uh, like that. So we have a small graph here, which we can refer to as a knowledge graph. And this uh, next diagram shows a much more enlarged one. We not only have Leonard Nimoy in Star Trek, we also have science fiction. Uh, not only Star Trek is science fiction, Star Wars is also is a science fiction. And Alec Guinness starred in Star Wars and Alec Guinness played Obi-Wan Kenobi, who's a character in Star Wars and so on. So this now becomes these, uh, I don't know, you can call them factoids or something. Uh, this collection of facts uh, become a graph, which we can now refer to as a knowledge graph. And these knowledge graphs can also be made more general. They don't necessarily have to be only uh, these uh, triplets. You can also have, the entities can have just attributes associated with them. So these are just uh, a, a pair. So here is an example of uh, a knowledge graph that not only shows the triplets, but also these pairs that uh, we have. This is a semantic knowledge graph representing relationships between the entities. Uh, for some reason, in all these papers, they use mo uh, actors in movies. Roberto Benigni uh, is the entity one, and uh, the entity two is the movie, Life is Beautiful. And uh, we have the predicate director, but uh, the uh, uh, Roberto Benigni also has, uh, I, I suppose this one is the, is, is the movie, and the other one is the Roberto Benigni. Okay, so this is the movie. The name of the movie is Life is Beautiful, and it is what it is, it's, it's a film, and here is a source URL for it. And then this one is Robert Benini, and the name is Robert Benini, there could be other things. So anyway, knowledge graph can have just pairs also. But this is how knowledge is represented. And uh, so these kinds of graphs uh, can be used uh, to do reasoning with them. And uh, so the issue that I, I'm first going to bring up is, uh, how can this be done with neural networks? And then uh, eventually I'll be talking about how the knowledge, the probabilistic knowledge graph that essentially doing the same thing. And, uh, and these are all, uh, when we have a lot of knowledge available, we use machine learning models, uh, which require training data. And we infer relationships between entities from training data sets, uh, as well as uh, from unstructured natural language as well. So this is our plan here. And there is uh, plenty of uh, relational databases that are around. That's what Google and others uh, leverage. And there are structured databases. And all of these uh, have the same kind of knowledge, not necessarily as three token sentences, but that's where the information is. And, uh, and these knowledge-based types can be talked about as common sense knowledge about everyday life. Free base is one of them, open sight and word net or wiki base, et cetera, are common sense knowledge that, uh, that are there. We'll talk about how they were obtained. And then there's also expert knowledge about an application AI system such as uh, gene ontology. So, so much of this is all there. And uh, we can talk about how they were constructed. Some of them are curated. The triples were created by experts in Psych and WordNet and UMLS, uh, which is a National Library of Medicine project. And uh, collaborative uh, approaches are triples created by volunteers like Wikidata and Freebase. And then there are automated semi-structured ones, triples from text via rules. And then automated unstructured ones, triples via, uh, uh, triples text via machine learning, natural language processing, and so on. The kind of thing I'm going to be emphasizing is the automated methods because they, they are the ones that end up uh, doing things probabilistically. And the uh, chart at the bottom, uh, again, is taken from the uh, Google paper on this topic, which is about five years old now. And it shows uh, how big these knowledge graphs uh, were. Uh, uh, free bases had 40 million entities and 35,000 relation types. And at the bottom is Google knowledge graph had 570 million entities and uh, 35,000 relation types. And, uh, and uh, I guess 18,000 uh, 18, million, um, million facts. So um, this is all, <laughs> five years ago. It's probably exponentially grown uh, since then. So the representations for these entities and relationships, uh, representation can be learned. And uh, each triplet in the knowledge base is a training example. And we can treat this as a machine learning problem and we maximize the training objective 
that captures the joint distribution. That's what we do in all machine learning. We capture a joint distribution in some uh, fashion of training. And uh, now that we have these kinds of facts available, can they be done the same way? And uh, now what we say is, well, you can do the same way. We can think of uh, uh, a, a three-dimensional tensor, which is just a three-dimensional array, where uh, each element has uh, three components. Uh, the element is y i j k, and uh, y sub i j k. That is, uh, i is the i entity, j is the j entity, and k is the k relationship. So we have now uh, we can think of uh, y being uh, a three-dimensional matrix or a tensor, which is uh, which spans all the entities and all the relations. I mean, it's an enormous, enormous uh, uh, array. Uh, given that uh, we are talking about millions of entities and uh, hundreds of thousands of relationships and so on. So this is a huge uh, tensor. And then uh, the right-hand side in the standard way of looking at a th third order tensor can be looked at in terms of fibers and slices and whatnot, to whatever is appropriate. So we do that in, in, in the deep learning terminology. So we're starting out with tensor representation. And uh, in addition to, so we have training data that says which are the, uh, which, are, which YJKs are true and which are not true and so on. And uh, we also need a uh, more model family if you're gonna be using machine learning methods. And in addition to training data, we also need to define a model family to train. And we extend neural language models to model entities and relationships. So whatever has been so successful with uh, neural language models, we can say, can be done here too. And uh, natural language models learn a vector which provides a distributed representation of each word. We saw an example right in the first slide where we uh, looked at a distributed representation of all words. They were all being mapped into 300 elements in an embedding vector. And uh, so these neural language models uh, have, have a distributed representation and also capture interactions between words such as which word is likely to come after a sequence of words by learning functions of these vectors. So we say, well, that's what has been done there and extend the approach to entities and relations by learning an embedding vector for each relation. So, uh, so we're saying models from language and knowledge bases close parallel between modeling language and knowledge encoded as relations. So the same ideas. Uh, and, uh, and then we use representation of entities done using knowledge bases, natural language sentences, data from multiple relational databases. So this is the kind of thing that's possible. And uh, so how are we going to parameterize these things? And we're going to be parameterizing, uh, I'll, I'll show a simple neural network uh, type of parameterization. But uh, this is a topic that's been around for a while. And so there have been various parameterizations of models, uh, so highly constrained parametric forms for linear relational embeddings using different forms, uh, vectors for entities, matrices for relations, and relations act like operators on entities. People have used that kind of parameterization. And the relations can be considered as any other entity allowing us to make statements about relations and so on. So there has been a lot of uh, water under this bridge of uh, of relations and uh, consisting of entities and so on. And uh, so these um, applications of neural language models, uh, uh, why do all of this? Uh, one of which is for link prediction to predict uh, missing arcs in the knowledge graph. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, why there would be missing arcs and how would you deal with it? And then um, entity resolution. If we find uh, a, uh, a relationship that A Guinness uh, uh, is uh, the founder of the Guinness uh, uh, brewery, uh, is that the same as Alec Guinness, uh, who's the uh, actor in Star Wars? Uh, uh, is this the same uh, A Guinness is the same as Alec Guinness or is that a different uh, A Guinness entity resolution? And then uh, link-based uh, clustering is extend feature-based clustering to relation uh, based on similarity of entities and relationships. And also another standard NLP task, which is word sense disambiguation, design, uh, deciding which of the senses of a word is appropriate one in some context. Link prediction is a fairly simple idea. 
And uh, why is this needed? Why do you have to pre predict missing arcs in the knowledge graph? Uh, you know, we're basically saying generalization to new facts based on old facts. So uh, that's because most knowledge bases are constructed manually. Probably they miss a majority of true relations. There might be even incorrect edges. Uh, so th those are the reasons for, uh, or there can be other things. These can be used in social networks and so on, where you're predicting uh, there's, there ought to be a link between these two people. They have so much in common. So uh, for instance, that can be done purely with a local similarity measure. The diagram at the bottom here shows an existing graph and we are trying to predict what other link could there be? And we're saying, look, uh, this red node has two neighbors uh, and the green node has two neighbors and these two are in common with each of them. So there are quite a few neighbors in common. Maybe they ought to have a link here. So that's predicting a link purely based on local similarity measures. And there are much more complex ideas, uh, global methods and so on. So that's the basic idea of using a, uh, uh, these kinds of ideas uh, of uh, representations to predict uh, uh, future links. And uh, yeah, one difficulty with predicting links is uh, how do you evaluate the performance of the model? And uh, uh, because uh, we only have positive examples and uh, how can you create uh, negative examples? We can artificially create it by taking true facts and creating corrupted versions of them, replacing one entity in the relation with a different uh, select entity selected at random and so on to see uh, how uh, uh, a model on link prediction does on um, things like that. So anyway, knowledge graphs, particularly probabilistic ones can be used uh, for these kinds of activities. And this is again an example of another application, which is entity resolution. Here we have uh, Arthur, actually the person A Guinness was Arthur Guinness. Arthur Guinness is known for uh, the Guinness uh, company, which produces a type of beer. There is a, there is a subgraph here. <coughs> and then you have uh, Alec Guinness is known for Dr. Zhivago and Dr. Zhivago is a movie and uh, Bridge on the River Kwai is a movie and then A. Guinness is known for the Bridge on the River Kwai and A. Guinness is known for Star Wars and perhaps all of this leads us to know that this A. Guinness is the same as Alec Guinness whereas this Arthur Guinness is not the same as this A. Guinness and so on. So these are, this is another type of task to clean up your knowledge graph, uh, the task of uh, entity resolution. <laughs> and then link-based clustering is, is another uh, idea of application. Anyway, all of this is to motivate why do we need knowledge graphs and what can you do with it? So these are all some examples given, particularly for the deep learning community. What are we gonna do with all of this? Um, and then the interesting part here, which is maybe a side trip here, uh, how question answering can be helped uh, by these kinds of things. Uh, by a, a general QA system must be able to process input information, remember facts, and organized in a way to retrieve and reason about them. And uh, this, re this remains a difficult and open problem which may be only solved in restricted toy environments. And again, this is the last part of the deep learning uh, 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 class uh, lecture, which is about uh, using uh, deep learning to uh, uh, to learn uh, relationships and uh, how, how you could use it. There's a, a couple of slides here which I'll go over quickly uh, and then come back to the mainstream of the knowledge graph and the probabilistic uh, approaches to it. And saying for question answering and all that, you're gonna need memory networks for remembering facts. And uh, neural networks uh, were not designed to do that. They're all processing elements which which go from one layer to the next layer to the next layer and to get an output. Uh, what about uh, just uh, facts and how can they be used? So intriguingly, there is a, there is a, a, a design called as a neural Turing machine, uh, which uses an explicit uh, memory network where uh, this diagram here, I hope you can see it, it's got a part here, which is a recurrent neural network. And there is a memory cells as if it's the tape of a Turing machine. Uh, and you write onto it and read from it and so on. So this is another uh, aspect of deep learning, which is going off to the direction of becoming a Turing machine, where it is not only uh, processing current information, but also has memory explicitly represented so that can be used. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, about those applications. I just talked about the applications.
So um, let's now get back into the main part of uh, statistical uh, relation learning or SRL is the creation of statistical models of relationship data. And we assume that the triples are assumed to be incomplete uh, and entities and the relation types may contain duplicates. So this gets to the, uh, for the first time, the, the title of this slide is what's supposed to be the title of my entire talk, which was probabilistic knowledge graphs. So uh, let's look at what this slide says. It's got uh, E consists of entities, E1, E2 through E and E, the number of entities. R is all the relations, R1, R2 through R and R is the number of relations. And so each possible triple is defined as X, I, J, K is E, I, R, K, E, J over a set of entities E and relations R. And as a binary random variable, Y, I, J, K belongs to zero, one that indicates its existence. So Y, I, J, K is equal to one if that relation exists, zero if it doesn't exist. And then all uh, possible triples in E cross R cross E can be grouped in an adjacency tensor, a three-way array, which is a uh, Y, uh, you know, bold Y, which is a three-dimensional tensor, belongs to zero, one, N E cross N E cross N R, whose entries are set such that Y I J K equal to one if the triple exists, zero otherwise, and uh, each possible realization of Y can be interpreted as a possible word. So we start out by defining it as it's either one or zero, but then we end up saying they, they are not going to be exactly one or zero. They're going to be probabilities. Uh, the same kind of trick we use when we introduce in machine learning a simple method called logistic regression. We, we talk about how uh, it's either uh, yes or no is the answer, but then uh, the model invariably outputs a real value between zero and one, which corresponds to the probability if it's being one uh, and the other, uh, other probability is the probability if it's being zero. So the same kind of thing goes on here, except we're dealing with these triples. And so the model for a knowledge graph is uh, we are interested in estimating the joint distribution PY from a subset D is a subset of E cross R cross E cross zero one of observed triples. So what we're talking about is a probability distribution over this uh, tensor Y which is a very, very huge tensor as we talked about already. You're talking about a probability distribution. What's the probability of that combination being true? Of course, if that exists, you know, we'd say, well, that's a, that's a probability one uh, and or very high probability and then other things have lower probability. So in doing so, we're estimating a probability distribution over possible worlds, which allow us to predict the probability of triples based on the state of the entire knowledge graph. So this is how we make the transition into a probabilistic knowledge graph. And the size of the adjacency tensor, Y can be enormous for large knowledge graphs. Example, in Freebase with over 40 million entities and 35,000 relations, the number of triples exceeds uh, 10 to the 19 elements. So Y can be as big as 10 to the power of 19. And the, but type constraints reduce this number even among syntactically valid triples, only a tiny fraction are likely to be true uh, example, there are over 450,000 actors and over 250,000 movies stored in Freebase, but each actor stars only in a small number of movies. So a lot of them are not meaningful. So this is uh, what we're dealing with. And uh, we can talk about statistical properties of knowledge graphs and knowledge graphs adhere to some deterministic rules such as stripe constraints and transitivity. If Leonard Nimoy was born in Boston and Boston is located in the USA, then we can infer Leonard Nimoy was born in the USA. And also various softer statistical patterns or regularities, which are not universally true, but nevertheless have useful predictive power. And like US born actors are more likely to star in US made movies. So there are, these are all these statistical properties are embedded. And, uh, so then we get to the point about statistical relation learning. So how do we learn this distribution? So we have triples correlated with certain other triples and random variables Y, I, J, K correlated with each other. And this is what we need to learn from data. And there are three main ways to model these correlations. One is latent feature models, um, which, are, which is the world of deep learning. Uh, and again, going back to the natural language idea, we're talking about modeling that individual English word 
by a third uh, by a 300 dimensional vector that is uh, uh, those are the latent features the got 300 latent features and y i j k are conditionally independent given a latent feature associated with the subject vegetable object type and additional parameters so we're getting to the point where they are all going to be independent features uh, in this latent feature space in which case uh, dealing with them in classification is pretty straightforward uh, there is also variants of this thing called graph feature models and another, another okay here again we have conditionally independent given observed graph features and additional parameters so the third one is a more interesting one which is a markov random fields assume all yijk have local interactions so the latent feature models have some conditional independence of, uh, assumptions which the markov random field uh, approach uh, does not so keep in mind what, what we're all we're trying to do is to come up with a representation of the probability distribution over this uh, tensor y uh, which, which which is assigning a probability to any uh, any uh, uh, fact you can think of. So this gets into now a little bit more detail of the, for example, models M1 and M2. The first one was based on latent uh, features. And so this is model like a standard neural network type of thinking. Almost this looks like a you know, linear regression type of problem. So we have model classes M1 and M2 predict the existence of a triple XIJK via a score function F of XIJK theta, theta is a set of parameters. It represents the model's confidence that the triple exists given the parameters theta. And uh, so we can now talk about a probability distribution. You see equation one, this is again a, taken from uh, the Google paper of what, five years ago. Um, so equation one of the paper is saying the probability distribution of y that is uh, over this entire enormous uh, tensor three-dimensional tensor is based on the data set d and parameters theta is uh, there is a product going on here this is all the independence uh, assumption here and we have a bernoulli of y i j k given sigmoid that's a standard sigmoid or logistic function that's operating on the output uh, of, uh, of this uh, feature function, all right, it represents uh, uh, the model's confidence it is, <laughs> and uh, of f of x i j k given theta. So it's a fairly straightforward form for this. <coughs> and so we're saying conditional variables y i j k are conditionally independent given global latent features and parameters. And uh, <coughs> so what is this, uh, <coughs> pardon me, Fortunately, I'm coughing in India and you cannot catch anything from me in, uh, in America or the internet, I hope. Um, so we, cause, uh, we discuss forms of uh, score function below and all models explain triples by latent features. <coughs> so what is this idea of latent features? These are things that a neural network discovers. This is what deep learning is all about. Uh, deep learning discovers you know, if you're even if you're trying to do a classification between dogs and cats, is figuring out something that you don't know what it is. There are latent features, and it <laughs> figures out there is something about it that is very special. That's what. So the same thing here, that uh, fact, Alec Guinness received Academy Award. So latent features could be. There's a possible explanation. He's a good actor. He uses latent features of entities. This is trying to give some uh, rationale as to what is it it is discovering. And uh, so we have latent features. <coughs> so we have <coughs> entity EI is represented, entity LA Guinness is represented by 0 0.9, 0 0.2, just like we had 300 elements, so on. So we <coughs> go into this space. <coughs> so the types of uh, uh, latent feature models, uh, there are so many of these things that have been proposed. Uh, one of these is called uh, RESCAL. <coughs> is uh, stands for uh, uh, some resolution uh, or something like that. Okay, I've got an exact definition of what RESCAL stands for. It uses a mathematical model here. It <coughs> <coughs> computes uh, FIJK from the entities and it, it figures out a particular uh, matrix W here. And there is one more, uh, EMLP based on a multi-layer perceptron. And then there is uh, one with, a, with an additive hidden layer here called ERMLP and so on. 
<coughs> so here are some diagrams of these uh, uh, different models uh, people have proposed. Based on subject and object, uh, it computes uh, a, a function here uh, based on, uh, okay, so we defined uh, F earlier on here as a, it represents the model's confidence that the triple exists given the parameters theta. So that's what it's um, computing here. <coughs> then this one is more the triple subject object predicate at the bottom. And uh, this is giving a, a, a value of the, the probability that this exists, or it's at least the function that, that it exists. And these two models have slightly different variations. This is EMLP and ERMLP and so on. Uh, presumably, this is how uh, Google uh, uh, implemented their system, their knowledge graph. It uses this kind of statistical models. And uh, we have, uh, how do we train this? What are the... <coughs> <coughs> maximizing and you look at this one this is standard uh, uh, standard expression involving a regularizing term here uh, that's coming into play we, we're doing maximization and uh, okay here is the loss function stated as a minimizing thing here and you have this lambda one and lambda two terms one we are minimizing the length of the norm vector here minimizing the length of the w vector here and so this is what Rascal uses. Okay, so that uh, part is uh, all about how we can use a deep learning sort of methods, neural network models to figure out a distribution of these Ys uh, using a standard uh, knowledge basis. And uh, you can create a, a statistical uh, model associating a probability with every possible relation that, that could exist. And this one goes on to another approach to the same problem. We are not using a neural network anymore. It is based on uh, a Markov random fields. Uh, uh, we drop the assumption that the random variables y, i, j, k are conditionally independent. And uh, <coughs> in the case of relational data and without the conditional independence assumption, <coughs> Each y, y, j, k can depend on any of the other random variables. And uh, so this is a standard Markov network. <coughs> and uh, so we use, uh, uh, you know, Markov random fields are famously used uh, when we don't want to model all relationships, only some subset of them. <coughs> That's what probabilistic graphical models are used for. <coughs> and how do we come up with these Markov random fields? and there are some kind of dependency graphs and this is standard definition of a Markov random field in terms of uh, the probability distribution of y and z is the standard partition function here and these are a bunch of uh, uh, potential functions here that defines a standard, um, standard Markov random field. So how does that relate to facts? And that's where the idea of Markov logic networks come into play and we combine the, the idea of Markov random fields with first order logic into a single representation which is absolutely fascinating and uh, we use a standard first order knowledge base a uh, set of sentences or formulas in first order logic this is old AI so it's, what, what's fascinating about it is uh, old AI meets a new AI into one representation and uh, this is supposed to be the you know, the frontier of, of deep learning is uh, how do we take advantage of all that is there in, and so uh, this, all of this stuff is about first order logic and so on, and definition of what is a Markov logic network. Ah, it's the end of it, okay. So I got more of this stuff, but this is nicely done. If you are more interested in this uh, Markov network approach and all that, uh, it's a very nice survey paper. Unfortunately, I don't have the, reference here but in my fuller um, slides uh, you'll find the exact reference if you're looking for my slides uh, this is just a mixture of two lectures i had i had a lecture this morning for my deep learning class where i didn't go so heavily into everything here and uh, that is available uh, on my uh, home page uh, i have uh, my course on deep learning all my slides are there and if you look into the part on knowledge, uh, presentation, reasoning, and question answering, you'll find some of the uh, earlier stuff on, of my slides there. 
uh, but if you're looking for the for my presentation of the entire Google paper, I've made a link to it uh, on another point on my uh, website, which is called uh, Talks or Presentations. Uh, I put all my slides out there, but I can also send uh, this particular version of it too, if anyone wants it, uh, I guess uh, to Ken or uh, Ram or one of them. Uh, I guess that's about all I have. And it's about 10.20 at night here, but I'm wide awake. So <laughs> please go ahead and uh, uh, ask me any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Ravi has a number of questions that he put into the chat. Yes. <clears throat> Ravi, you're also coughing. Uh, yes, can you uh, hear me? Uh, Everybody's uh, coughing, I guess. <laughs> okay. And it just started. It's nervousness of dealing with tensors. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, tensor is just generated. Don't worry about it. Yeah. The the thing is that uh, it is hard to understand relational databases that are generally uh, conceptually can be looked at as as um, uh, triples, right? Right. But right. to go on to those triples and make them into not only a vector space, but a tensorial space, three tensor three approach would mean that three elements that can be, <coughs> excuse me, related in any which way. Right. So hey, it is very uh, hard to think conceptually yeah. in terms of things yeah. like Rascal. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that is right. Uh, you know, uh, this is the same kind of boldness one needs. Uh, you know, if you were doing natural language processing uh, a few years ago, you would have uh, learned a lot about syntax and semantics and how things get connected in language and all that. All of that uh, has to be forgotten now uh, with this new world of deep learning in natural language processing where all we talk about are word embeddings in a latent space. And so words become word to vec, becomes a vector and uh, everything gets processed uh, over there. And so you don't need all those other kind of logic and all that uh, you had in NLP. Uh, same kind of thing here also. Uh, this is not words we are dealing with. We are dealing with uh, facts uh, represented as relations. And uh, every one of them is now just an element in, a, in this huge space now. And it's also probabilistic in nature. It's not even it exists or not. Uh, it's not one zero. So it is 0 0.99 or 0 0.01, that kind of a thing. So everything is a problem so over all possible facts. So Sri Hari, what my uh, very good, I mean, you, you answered some of it, but what I'm saying is it is hard to imagine a point IJK itself in multidimensional space. Uh -huh. Is the multidimensionality of that IJK tensor related only to these three element types where I type is one, J type is one, K type is one? Right. Or I, J, K themselves could be variables. Yeah, see, we have, we end up with features also, you know, so we have latent features associated. So we talked about Y, I, J, K represented in terms of X, I, J, K. Uh, and those are the features that correspond and are learned with a neural network with many layers and so on. So there is two things going on here that not only do we have a three-dimensional tensor, we also have a set of features uh, that the model uh, learns through the parameters data. So all of this come into play uh, in, uh, in, in this particular model. Yeah, so, so that is how we map. We have that uh, F of uh, XIJK colon theta uh, is uh, what is used uh, through a sigmoid, which is mapping it into uh, you know, values between zero and one. So that is how this model works. So this is essentially probabilistic. And uh, this is the standard thing in machine learning. In machine learning, we start out saying everything is so clear cut. It is a cat or a dog. But we end up always uh, modeling it probabilistically. And we refer to this as uh, 
you know, a surrogate function. So we say we, we bring in a surrogate uh, function in place of the real thing and it's going to be, act like a probability uh, even though the original setting for training the model, you say, well, here is a picture of a cat and it's a cat, yes or no. Uh, but uh, we but, uh, but how way. does it become how does it become probability by some kind of circle of confusion nearest neighbor interactions existence of relation or absence of relation like yeah. uh, on broken triple or something of that sort how yeah. do you how do you bring uncertainty into a well defined tensor you have to think about, uh, we don't even have to worry about uh, a three-dimensional tensor and all. Think of the simplest uh, task, uh, which is uh, called logistic regression, which is there are only two classes, zero and one. And uh, so something is input and you say yes or no is the answer. And how do you train uh, such a model? We use this idea of logistic regression, which says, well, based on a set of inputs, we uh, values we say well if that's one or that's a zero and uh, we as associate weights with each of these values and we take the weighted features and we input it to the sigmoid function which is a mapping between zero and one and uh, we use uh, this simple model called logistic regression all it is doing is take your set of features associate a weight with each of these feature multiply them add them up input it to the sigmoid function that will map it to zero and one. So the whole learning problem would be, how would you figure out the weights? And we use a simple uh, gradient descent to figure out the weights. And the model that we ended, I end up with now is able, of course, we have to use a training set uh, of data. All of them are run through the system to figure out the weights it's called, uh, you know, mini batches and so on. So this ends up learning these. So essentially it uh, learns in terms of this model, those weights end up assigning, um, you know, close to one, you know, you're, you're never going to get to one because you're going to be using a sigmoid function. It's going to be close to one. And sigmoid is almost a jump from zero to one, but it's smooth and continuous and which involves a gradient descent. You're going to be taking derivatives and so on. So, so it ends up being a continuous function between zero and one. And instead of one, we're going to get 0.99. What it, what it means is probability one is 0.99. That's what it is saying. So that is how you force a system which was uh, initially defined as simple set of discrete values to become a probabilistic model in a very natural way based on the data set that you have. Presumably your data set has got now a lot of variabilities in it. Some noise is involved. That is where this comes into play. So you might have uh, certain dogs that don't look quite like dogs and so on. So that's noisy data. Same thing in a Thank knowledge you. base also. We are saying the knowledge base may not be perfect. There might be uh, uncertainties involved and the model is very ready to model these uncertainties and uh, model it in that case. So there are two things going on. One is the, there is noise in the system and there is also uh, the model we are using, it is forcing things into a continuous world rather than in, stay, stay in a discrete world. Very good. Last question is on theta. What is theta and how do you determine its relevance? Theta is just all the parameters of your network. So this is, uh, oh. a, yeah, it's a neural network. Just like I mentioned in logistic regression, we are taking some input and mapping it to, into zero or one. And along the way, we have a set of weights associated with all the features for this input you have. And the theta, so you start out with an arbitrary set of values. This is how, this is how machine learning works. You said, well, uh, initialize your parameters with something. It might be terrible. Uh, there are some guidelines how to pick it. And uh, you say, look at all the outputs. These are uh, not right. And then we go back and keep changing it and changing it until it stabilizes and say, those are your set of parameters. Same thing goes on here in terms of uh, we need a uh, model to be trained. That's why we defined a loss function. And uh, so for any given uh, set of uh, inputs, uh, the loss function is computing. Well, how close is it to be right? And, uh, and then uh, we use the loss function, take the derivative of the loss function and we increment all the weights until you stabilize using uh, mini batch, um, uh, you know, epochs and all this type of stuff to come up with uh, 
a final set of weights. So theta is just consists of an enormous number of parameters that are being used uh, in the neural network. If you are going to use the latent uh, feature model for a statistical um, knowledge graph, the um, Markov uh, network approach which is the alternative approach that doesn't work exactly like this, but uh, uh, it will also use some kind of optimization and so on. So, so anyway, I, I just talked about the simpler version. And the paper that uh, the Google folks wrote, it seemed like they chose this approach. They were using a neural network, they're using exactly this model. And I mentioned how large their uh, knowledge graph is. And, uh, and so they, uh, they use this uh, neural network approach uh, to construct a probabilistic uh, model of the knowledge graph. Uh, so once you have constructed this model, you know, one of their, their uses is uh, towards uh, creating knowledge panels, right? On your, uh, on your Google screen, when you search on something, if you're searching about an entity such as a person, object or place or thing, it will give you a knowledge panel on the right hand side uh, like leonard nimoy if you searched on it will show you a picture of leonard nimoy it will also show the movies he acted in and it will show you a picture of william shatner who also acted with linear leonard nimoy in star trek and so on so and how do they get this from a probabilistic uh, knowledge graph is uh, of course they're using uh, something like um, the map estimation right what is the most uh, probable most probable uh, relationships that exist and you, you use that. So it is not stored in a discrete way, it's stored in a probabilistic way. And uh, you just do an inference algorithm to figure out what is the best, uh, um, the best possible value for these things. If it is above 0 0.9, you put it out in the knowledge panel, I suppose, something like that. But very nicely done uh, in, in that paper. And my uh, full set of slides, so, uh, my original intention was to present that entire paper, but along the way, I kind of mixed it up with, uh, with my deep learning course. Uh, is, uh, I have my slides to explain that paper, but the paper itself is very nicely done, about uh, six or seven authors. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> David Eddy has a question, I believe. Uh, David? What is, what is uh, Oh, very good. Uh, is there any attention paid at all? Well, let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, this looks to me like an exercise of uh, looking at reality through the fact that I can see visible light. And since I can see, my eyeballs can only see visible light, this is evidence, this is hard evidence, this is proof that x-rays, gamma rays, et cetera, et cetera, uh, infrared light do not exist. You're only looking at data sets you can get your hands on. What about the data sets you can't get your hands on? Silence. <laughs> That's a stumper, isn't it? Hello? Hari, are you still there? Did I lose you? <laughs> we might have a network problem. Mm -hmm. I was certainly impressed at the quality. If he's in India, the quality of that connection was, was astonishing. Yeah, that's what he said in the beginning, that it has been very good. Yeah, so I guess your question is similar to my question. Um, I can see uh, Sri Hari, unless it's, uh, it, it is a dynamic picture, but apparently he can't hear us. So, star six, if he has been muted by any chance. No, he's still on. Oh, he's, he's on he's cloud. Still... He's on cloud. Sagar, are you there? Sargur, Sri Hari, are you there? I don't hear him. <laughs> this other sitting very still, or his picture's frozen as well. Uh, David, in your question, I have a short comment. Certainly. Unless you have a sensor that is tuned 
for out of the visible light detection you will not know that you are missing a data set correct That's so correct. when you discover x ray detector or gamma ray detector or microwave detector that's when you will complete the picture correct otherwise you would think that other than visible doesn't exist correct and that this, this this is my point is that we're looking at data sets that we can get our hands on and the data sets behind the corporate firewall which you can't get your hands on uh and i'm i'm particularly interested i'm not interested in data per se i'm not interested in the value david eddy or ken bakowski i'm interested in the various representations of F name, L name. The systems, the machine tools that make the data. To the best of my knowledge. But, uh, yeah. To the best of my knowledge, that information is left out of these, uh, these uh, considerations. Well, it's an incompleteness kind of theorem. You know, how do you know that your axioms, assumptions, and the space that you are defining is complete, that is closed and complete? So, well, completeness you, well, assumption is very difficult one in physics, at least. <laughs> well, no, I'm not, not, nothing as complex as, well, I don't know if it's more or less complex. We know that, that information systems software exist i hope because evidently a lot of people spend money on software and systems but these graph knowledge machine learning etc ignore the existence of the systems they only look at the output of the systems well yes i like your what... comment on the unnatural language this is part of what Which John software. Soa has been saying. Um, that the, yes, this is part of what John Soa has been saying that the um, they that these are very limited positive statements, um, and um, so the the theory that can be derived is very um, restricted. Yes, I, um, I I count myself in John's camp, and I appreciate mm -hmm. his frustration. Uh, and I'm trying for particularly from two, three weeks ago is evident, obvious, long-standing frustration, expression of frustration. How do we turn that into an advantage? Don't, I don't have an answer yet. Well, I think it's clear that, that one can do, um, that, that this is very sophisticated work within this limited domain. Um, yes. and so our, for us, the challenge is how to, position the limited domain in a broader domain so well, that I, people can understand that yeah you can see huge potential but it's very different to things like fibo for example that david mentioned so when we do a, a standard ontology it's a bit like when we do a, a a human dictionary we try and lock down the meanings of things and stop them sliding around <laughs> because brains do the opposite brains each time we hear a word we subtly update the actual meaning of that word as experienced in, in that brain. So the opportunities for this, if I've understood it right, he, he went through three possible use cases at the beginning, but to me it looks bigger than that, which is that you've got something that can do what a brain does, or you've got something that can use neural functions, or you can apply neural functions to learn stuff, while at the same time everything that's learned continues to have the kind of you know, RDF graph and owl semantics that we're used to. So you have a completely transparent, completely explainable uh, uh, learning AI. That's massive, but there's absolutely no overlap with what you would do with that and what you would do with a standardized ontology where you have the explicit opposite aim of trying to stop things from changing and moving around. So I think the limit is our imagination as to the very different ways we could use it, the ways we've been using uh, other industry ontologies. I would, I, I certainly on my radar is a, a standard dictionaries. I mean, I've had my conversations with lexicographers and uh, as much as I love the uh, Oxford English and American dictionaries, uh, they explicitly exclude unnatural language. And I, I particularly, Mike, I like your, whenever we hear, hear a new word, 
you know, we sort of slide, <laughs> we modify my, the existing, my existing understanding. Oh, here's another meaning for this thing. Exactly. Of that. And that's why we have dictionaries to standardize the interchange of, you know, that when you, when somebody uses a word, you can look it up and agree I, I, what you mean by it, but it's the opposite of what brains actually do. But I'm, I, I'm arguing that in, in the context of, of, of operational systems, huge amounts of the language in those systems is simply not non-existent in any form in dictionaries. Yes, other yes. Than the software is. <coughs> I, <coughs> yeah, that's a different issue, but you're right. I agree. Oh. And <laughs> if you allow, I will give an example of the 70s where we developed uh, crop classification algorithms based on multispectral thematic data. So the, in terms of vector, it's a multi-dimensional vector or a tensor. So each frequency being one part of that. And then we had to use Bayes decisions to reach at whether something is a rice paddy or something is a dryland crop, things of that sort. I see well, very similar approach in back. some of what Sri Hari described here. So Hari's back. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, Sorry good. about it. My, my internet service provider in Bangalore suddenly cut me off. <laughs> I couldn't do anything. Now yes, it's back I could me. see the cloud go away. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, I know I was in the middle of something and, uh, and I went away. Maybe you, you had a good discussion on it. I, I have one question, if uh, can you permit just a quick one. Sure. I was giving my audience, uh, my colleagues here, a similarity with crop classification in multispectral scanning images. There you have like a multidimensional vector or a tensor, and then you use base classification because of the uncertainty of being able to say whether it's a rice paddy or a dryland crop. So yes. you, what you define on natural language or the knowledge base uh, elements, IJK, is similar to what we would observe in machine learning about the crop classification. You know, all of, uh, of machine learning uh, for the purpose of either regression or classification, it uh, outputs a continuous value. Um, if it is two class, it's between zero and one, and then there is a generalization of it called softmax. You can go to multiple, multiple types of crops. So the, you can just say there are only two classes. Uh, and so it, it always maps into a value zero, one, and uh, it, it never is saying exactly zero or one. And why has it become this? Actually, the very first uh, algorithm for doing this uh, uh, was uh, an algorithm called perceptron, which was uh, trained on yes or no. There was no such thing as doing back propagation. It was simply uh, changing the weights by counting, by adding, if it was wrong, you simply add the value of the input uh, to the weight and move it in that direction. But that was uh, not generalizable. Uh, and it, they, they could not use gradient descent with it and uh, so it had to be abandoned and uh, you ended up uh, defining an alternative uh, loss function uh, where you don't even use the misclassification as the uh, exact uh, loss function you end up uh, with slightly different variants uh, such as uh, uh, the cross entropy and so on and and you take derivatives of it it, it ends up uh, you know in a continuous value now you talked about base classifier. Well, okay, that's essentially a generative model where uh, you're talking about looking at uh, the probability distributions, the, uh, the conditional probability and the a priori probability are thrown into a base classifier to determine uh, what is the probability of the class. So there you are essentially uh, doing it as a probabilistic modeling. In what I described, we don't necessarily set out as uh, we want it to be probabilistic. We just want a continuous function that you can do derivatives with and so on. And uh, it essentially ends up uh, capturing the probabilities, except it's what we call as a discriminative classifier. What you are describing is a generative classifier. 
generative classifier means that you learn the probability distribution of class y given input x uh, and that's what we want to determine class y given input x and you, and you do it by uh, knowing the uh, the uh, class conditional distribution that is x given y and the a priori distribution probability of y and so that is a generative model where you are setting up probability distributions and no no wonder you get a probability as output the discriminative model on the other hand isn't set up like that it is set up just purely to do the task of classification i just know that for this crop this is the value and uh, we end up again becoming probabilistic uh, as uh, it is kind of impli you know what do you say Im implicit it's not explicit uh, as as the base classifier does so these are two different models but they end up going to the same place uh, if you have a data set that's what the discriminative classifier also does although it's trying to do the job directly rather than indirectly like a base classifier we refer to the base classifier as a two step approach first you go about estimating the class conditional distribution and the a priori distribution and then you use those uh, for the purpose of doing the uh, final task which is uh, i just need to know the class what kind of crop it is so that there's a difference between the two models but they end up at the same place thank you so uh, we're we're oh, kind okay. of running a little late any any further questions repeat the first question repeat the first question about uh, incomplete data uh, incomplete data you know this is the beauty of these kinds of models i was i was, I was before my isp provider cut me off briefly i was talking about uh, the beauty of these probabilistic graphical models if you had 100 variables and i wanted to have a probability of all 100 co uh, combinations of 100 variables you would have to have you know 2 to the power of 100 uh, entries in the table which is which is impossible whereas uh, all you have is 100 nodes and we connect these 100 nodes which are the important connections uh, and we end up with a probabilistic graphical model and uh, given the probabilistic graphical model i just look at it uh, and say okay these nodes are connected to each other so we simply write out a uh, algebraic expression that says p of a times p of b given a and p of c given a and b and so on uh, we model the whole joint distribution as a set of uh, conditional distributions and which kind of breaks down the problem and you model only the important conditional distributions and now you have a model of the entire possibility you have never seen certain combinations i think the question was about what about things you have never seen well that's exactly what these models do they will give you a probability for things you have never seen before it has a way of computing it because you have you have been able to give me data that says only these uh, variables are are, co are, uh, are correlated that's what a pgm does so that is the beauty of an entire bayesian network is to be able to tell you the probability of any combination 2 to the power 100 is is an impossibly large number uh, just to even to write down the table let alone have enough data to estimate uh, the number of times that each uh, possible combination occurs you don't have to worry about all that all you have to worry about is what are these simple sub substructures you need what are the conditional probabilities of just pairs of variables or triples of variables and so on with that you can model the entire joint which means uh, i can give you i've never seen i've seen never seen most of these combinations but i can give you a probability it's only going to be as good as how good those uh, conditional probability distributions are and uh, that is the same basic concept is being carried over into into a higher level thing here but you know that's what you have to keep in mind and and that's what probabilistic graphical model markov networks do that for you with uh, undirected uh, uh, edges and bayesian networks do the same thing for you with uh, directed edges uh, um, okay so the issue of not having seen things we never worry about because it is not explicitly writing things down it is implicit and in that implicitness you can get any combination you want in the inference process Oh, with that, uh, um, okay. can I, I have one oh, Janet? Yes, hi. Um, so, um, so Judea Pearl shifted from focus on correlational Bayesian networks as knowledge representations in the 80s to now um, causal um, reasoning. And so could you say something about your perspective on the um, 
correlational versus causal reasoning, and uh -huh. this is um, sophisticated work that can be done on correlations. Yeah. But is that a limitation of this as in terms of subsuming um, AI in general? Yeah, excellent question. That's a frontiers of, uh, of AI question you're asking me. I can just speculate on it. Actually, I do have a small lecture on causal reasoning. I teach a different course called Probabilistic Graphical Models. It's all based on Daphne Kohler's uh, book, uh, which is now about 10 years old. Um, that is uh, different from my deep learning course. Uh, the last chapter is on causal models. Uh, uh, and that has always been a huge uh, and difficult topic. Uh, Bayesian networks are not necessarily causal, as you probably know. Uh, you can have any kind of uh, directionality and so on, but you want a directionality which uh, makes sense that A causes B and B does not cause A. And correlation between A and B doesn't mean that A causes B or B causes A. And uh, uh, you know, how do we figure this out? Does smoking cause cancer or does cancer cause smoking? They're just correlated to each other. How do we figure out that it is really smoking that causes cancer and not cancer that, that causes people to take up smoking? Um, so uh, how do we do that is you bring in uh, other variables uh, into the picture that point to the fact that uh, that is more probable than the other way. So you can't just do it with two variables uh, as to which causes which. You need a, a third or fourth variable to disambiguate and so that you can figure this out. I mean, I'm just answering it at a very, very high level about um, you know causality and, and correlation. As you know, cor cor causality is not the same as uh, correlation. So that is, uh, the, you know, in a whole separate area. And uh, these, uh, today I talked only about Markov networks. Markov networks are not so suited for causality. Uh, it doesn't have directionality in it. Um, it simply says uh, when there is a connection and an edge between two variables, it means these two are, are correlated. It doesn't say anything about causality. A Bayesian network is more appropriate saying one is parent of the other because that means A causes B. Uh, or we can interpret it uh, if the Bayesian network is, is, is proper. So I did touch upon the causality issue today. I talked about a basic a probabilistic graphical model that was undirected. I talked about these uh, latent variable models, which are just uh, machine learning, deep learning approaches uh, to this. Uh, but that is an area I keep hearing about it as uh, the uh, you know uh, holy grail type of thing is uh, how can uh, we integrate all of this into, into one system. But I think the idea of Markov logic networks uh, coming into play is maybe a first step towards that. So that's all I can say about this. I've had a student uh, struggle with this, with this issue about, you know, I told him, why don't you work on figuring out whether A causes B or B causes A. And, uh, you know, he tried uh, all kinds of methods. We weren't too satisfied with uh, the results we got. There was even a competition on this a few years ago. I don't know where that stands because they knew in the data what the causality was, like it's a medical data set or something. And they wanted an algorithm to figure out uh, about the, the, the cause. You know, they would know the right answer. And so they had a competition. And I'm not sure how that turned out, but uh, you know, it, this is causality is, is the most important issue in science as a whole, isn't it? Like, you know, Newton figured out that the cause of the apple falling down was gravity, right? So, uh, it's science is about causality. So uh, it's no wonder that uh, we don't have some simplistic algorithms that, that do this. So maybe, maybe the state has advanced a bit. I've not really kept up with the, um, the, the causal model area, but, uh, but I still keep hearing that, that that's what one should be looking at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, this, that's very, very good. The, um, uh -huh. So that's interesting to put all of this sophisticated work in context with uh, uh, developing frontier, which is, um, as you said, um, yeah, not not yet uh, mastered. Yeah, you know, actually, uh, you know, many companies are uh, putting efforts in these things, and I heard the Intel, <laughs> fourth place of Intel, the Intel research uh, head uh, talking about what are you guys doing nowadays, you know, and. And he was talking about how this uh, probabilistic uh, one of one of the, one of the things they are doing is quantum computing. Of course, Intel is is, uh, is spending time on quantum computing. Another thing they are doing is uh, 
uh, neuromorphic computing, they call it, which is about brain-like uh, hardware. And the third area was this uh, probabilistic computing, he called it, and uh, which could include, uh, I would think, the, one of the most important problems they would be looking at is this, this causality. And uh, I'm sure there is lots of uh, smart people thinking about uh, this issue. That is going to be one of the things that uh, even a hardware company is spending um, resources on. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. That's a wonderful, wonderful talk. Oh, thank you, Hari. That was really great. Uh, so uh, we will adjourn the meeting now and uh, I will. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all. And uh, you're all in uh, different parts of the world. as uh, America, I suppose. Stay, stay safe. Okay. Bangalore is a, a little safer than in America, at least, at least now. I uh, hope it uh, doesn't get Just, back just here, for I the think. time being, yes. Yeah. We have a different rate of peaking in different parts of the world. Yeah. Yes, and I invite everyone to come next week uh, when uh, Spencer Briner will be speaking. So um, uh, that's next Wednesday. And uh, thanks again.